Hi, and thank you for tuning into my video. My name is Sarah, if you don't already know me. If you do already know me, then welcome back. All right, going through this stash makes me feel more vulnerable and exposed than anything else because these paintings, uh, not just the art, but the stuff I've written on them, it kind of feels like I'm reading you my diary. Uh, if you want to skip the introduction where I'm just like talking to the camera and just see the flip through, uh, it won't be as wobbly and shaky as this. I, I use a tripod. This is just me holding it with my hand. Uh, but yeah, if you want to skip to that part, I would say skip about 25 minutes into the video and it should be straight into the paintings. I've got a huge stack of watercolor paintings here and I've, I've been kind of meaning to make a video showing you all of my old watercolor paintings for a couple of weeks now, ever since I first started moving my channel in the direction of an art channel. But there's been something holding me back from that. And, you know, I was, I was kind of meditating on this over the past few days, and I figured out what it is that's been holding me back. And that is that for me, uh, art has always been more than just the creation of images. It's been somewhat of a spiritual practice. And if you're one of my regular viewers, if you've seen some of my videos, you probably already know this because I've described drawing and painting, uh, especially my, my style of non-representational, spontaneous, abstract art, as being like a meditation for me. Um, but if, if you're new, you might be kind of wondering what I mean by that. So, for example, if, if somebody is an illustrator, their goal when they create an image is to represent something recognizable, to, to convey a message through that illustration. Whether it's, it's a comic book and you're supposed to be able to see what the character is doing in the scene, or if it's for an advertisement and it's meant to show the product in the best possible scenario. Um, or a, a movie poster to attract an audience. Basically, the purpose of an illustration is to represent something in a stylized, artistic sort of a way. Um, and then there's the gallery artists, the fine artists who have a, a lofty notion that they want to express in a less instantly recognizable sort of a way, uh, where the job of the viewer is to interpret the work in their own unique way. And so it's not really uh, created to blatantly illustrate something the way an illustration would. It's, it's created more to convey a notion or a conceptual idea in more of a loose, open to interpretation sort of a manner. And for me, my work is something different than both of those. It's, it's not illustration. And it's also not fine art. And, and this is something that I've been struggling with it, as far as how do I identify and describe what I do. And in my last video, I got a little annoyed. Not my last video, I guess my last video I told some stories from high school, but the video before that, where I respond to the art troll critic people uh, who referred to my work as decorative. Um, I say that word with a little bit of disdain because it's not decorative uh, or ornamental. And so it's funny because I, I find my style is something that I can't categorize as illustration or necessarily as fine art because it's not being made to go in an exhibit or to be shown in a gallery. And it's not therapy art because I don't feel like it's a release for something. It's more like a just an intense yearning that I have to create something that has never been created before. And for me, the, the beauty and the joy of abstract expressionism, um, of, of free association, non-representational artwork, it's the same joy that I would have when I read a stream of consciousness poem by the beatniks, or if, if you see somebody doing a spontaneous interpretive dance at a modern art center, and you know it hasn't been choreographed, but they flow with the music in such a beautiful expressive way, it's better than something pre-planned and practiced and rehearsed, um, or jazz music. For me, the, the abstract art that I make is like 
my spirit dancing through my physical body onto a sheet of paper. And I finally understood what it is, how I would categorize this work. It's as a meditation manifest. The really funny thing is, years and years ago, back when I had just gotten out of, not gotten out of, back when I just quit art school after my second year, I made a little uh, handmade book where I bought this beautiful handmade Cadi brand paper, which is, I think it's the paper press uh, made entirely out of recycled materials that was created when India first gained its independence from the British. The Cadi paper brand um, started as a cottage industry where villagers could make their own paper and sell it internationally uh, to make money in a way that wasn't controlled by the Britishes who had invaded and kind of stolen their, their country. Um, so I liked the story behind that brand of paper. Long story short, um, I bought a big stack of that paper, made it into kind of a DIY style zine booklet where I stapled a bunch of them together and then glued photocopies of my drawings into it. And I put just a really simple handwritten title on these little zine style self-published arts and crafts books. Uh, and I called it Meditations Manifest. And the subtitle was A Collection of Thoughtless Drawings. And the reason I called it that was because for me, when I start drawing, if I'm not talking as I draw, like I've been doing in some of my art videos, when I start drawing like that, my thoughts will literally disappear. I, I get to enjoy that beautiful state of pure conscious awareness without a linguistic verbalization. And this is something that people describe as enlightenment or as the pure meditation state, but it's also something enjoyed by a lot of athletes. Like when they get into the zone, um, runners talk about this, when they get into the running zone and they're running and running and suddenly it's like time disappears. And whether a second goes by or 10 minutes goes by, they're so in the flow of what they're doing that they don't realize it. And when I draw and when I paint, that's the kind of zone I go into. And so the, the reason I kind of resent it when people refer to this as therapeutic, it's that this is beyond anything that could be therapeutic. It, it's something meditative. It's like being in that space of pure creation. The reason I've always loved abstract expressionist painters like Vasily Kandinsky, um, and, you know, the Mark Rothko who made the Rothko Temple, um, and so many others. Uh, somebody commented on a recent video of mine saying that there's a book called The Women of Abstract Expressionism. Um, I've added that to my wish list when business picks up again, when the economy bounces back. That'll be one of my first treats to myself. But anyway, the reason I've always loved like the, the automatistes in Montreal and, and those artists who make something purely non-representational is that I can feel that the artist who made that piece was in that pure creative zone while they made it. And looking at the kind of art that's made in a meditative state can really help bring the viewer into a meditative state. In that video I had made responding to art critics, I had started telling a story of one of my all-time favorite synchronous experiences, which was that I had installed a huge um, number of prints of the same highly detailed abstract drawing in the students' gallery at the Emily Carr University of Art. And it was the, the end of the semester show, kind of going into Christmas break. So a lot of people actually got to see that exhibit, which was exciting for me. Um, and I put up a, a wall just covered in prints of my drawing. And my goal for that was to share that ecstasy beyond verbalization, that languageless communication, that, that thoughtless awareness that I enjoyed while drawing. I was really hoping that viewers would recognize that. And 
really the, the greatest feedback I've ever had as an artist was when a friend of mine told me that a friend of hers had gone to that student show and looked at that wall of my drawing and felt like he was elevated outside of his body into this zone of pure consciousness. He described it as being uh, like a, a moment of pure nonverbal out of body awareness. And it's kind of like from there on, nothing can top that. Like as far as getting an exhibit goes, as far as selling work goes, as far as getting commissions or getting gallery representation, in a way it's like the, the goal that I had going in to art school and the, the motivation I had behind sharing my art, it was fulfilled uh, by that one person having that one experience. And of course that doesn't mean that's it because ideally everybody who's looking at art at least looking at art from the perspective of searching to experience what the artist experiences or connect with that divine flow i would love to share that with everybody which is why i've started doing these art videos but it, it's a it's a thing that's so personal for me that it almost feels like i'm exposing myself when i share my art and like i said i've been planning to share my watercolor paintings for a while now, but I've held myself back from it because so many of them are so deeply personal and deeply spiritual to me that I've been a little bit afraid of getting feedback. Um, and it's not that I'm afraid of people's criticisms because hell, I've, I've spoken about cult experiences on this YouTube channel and brainwashing experiences and uh, I've spoken out against other popular people on YouTube who I find a little dubious. And so I'm no, I'm no stranger to criticism or, or to being um, the target of trolls. But what I've been a little bit nervous about is some of the spiritual messages that I've written on some of these watercolor paintings kind of as a form of a title or these these uh, realizations I've had in that thoughtless space while creating. Sometimes when I finish a piece, I'll write down on that piece in the best approximation to verbalization, the feeling that I had while creating. And as an example of that, the first painting I want to show in this video, um, it's a painting that I made when I felt like for the first time after years, my life was going in the direction I wanted it. Um, I painted this piece when I came out of a really bad relationship, when I, I, I got out of a really toxic work environment too. I'd been working fashion retail at a highly competitive, stressful, commission-based work environment where I really, um, every day going into work was like entering a, a fight among a bunch of women who were cutting each other down for sales goals. Um, so I finally got out of a toxic relationship and got out of a toxic workplace and started working at a store that I loved, which is called Dragon Space in Vancouver. I still love that store. Best store I've ever worked, hands down. Um, I started reading tarot cards professionally, a series of synchronicities led me to kind of getting discovered by one of the local tarot card readers in Vancouver. And I had a beautiful condo for the first time. I was renting a room in a beautiful condo. And it's like everything that could go right was going right. So one day between clients at that tarot studio, I pulled out my watercolor kit and I made this piece. And there was something about it that had a brightness that my previous art hadn't had. I, I used to use a lot of really monochromatic color palettes, um, really dark colors, a lot of blacks, a lot of dark purples, a lot of, you know, the primary colors, but always with a shade added into them. This was one of the first paintings I made, just using really bright, cheerful colors. And there was something about it when I finished it that even when the painting felt complete to me, I didn't immediately move back from that creative zone into, 
ordinary verbalized thought. I just kind of gazed into it for a while and, and felt the painting. And without even, it, it's so hard to try to put this kind of stuff into words, guys, because it's the kind of thing I have never talked about with anybody before. But without planning or thinking about it, I just took my pen that I had kind of done the, the drawn elements with and I wrote on the bottom after peeling off the painter's tape the words, silence speaks the depths of still waters where manifestation requires no action. And I signed it, I dated it July, August 2009. Um, and that was exactly the very beginning of my time as a tarot card reader. And you know, the, the cult leader from India whose organization I had been sucked into for nine years, I first found him in September of 2009. So this is one of those paintings that for me, it feels really fresh and really purely my own because I made it before I went into that really crazy period of my life. And like I said, sharing it, I can't talk about these paintings without talking about the spiritual goals that I set out to achieve when I started painting them or the, the state of mind I was in when I created them. So I'm going to stop speaking to the camera and just show you the art as I talk about it because I find it a little easier uh, to talk when the camera's not directly on me, especially when it's about something really personal like this. But I hope you enjoy the video. I hope this kind of articulates a little bit what my artistic goals are and what this kind of art means to me. Um, before I do that though, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to everyone who has been showing me your art. I've mentioned in a couple of videos now, especially the videos I do where I'm just drawing and talking as I draw, I've mentioned that, you know, it would be cool if the people watching those videos don't just listen to me and watch me draw, but pick up a pen and paper or pencil and paper or whatever art materials you have available to you. If you draw along with me, just keep me on in the background as that, that uh, thing that you listen to while creating and create some works of your own. And I've been so excited to see five pieces now made by lovely viewers like you, or maybe literally you if you're one of those five people, uh, who have tagged me and said, this is what I made while listening to your videos. And just like, you know, way back when, when a friend of mine saw my, my prints up at the Emily Carr student gallery and said that it triggered an out of body experience and, and that feeling of thoughtless awareness I felt that same excitement and job satisfaction, like like the purpose for which I set out to do this has been fulfilled. The same way I used to draw with the goal of sharing that space of creativity to those who see the drawings, my goals have kind of shifted now to not only sharing what I'm feeling when I draw to the people who see the drawings, but also sharing that creative enthusiasm to make something so other people can experience what it feels like, you know, to start with a blank piece of paper and a desire to manifest something from within themselves to actually doing it. Um, one of my favorite channels on YouTube is called Peter Draws. And this it's this guy called Peter who just draws and talks. I kind of got the idea for my art videos from his channel. And in one of his recent videos, he said something that really struck a chord in my heart. He said that sometimes when he does a video where he draws something, he looks at the finished drawing afterwards and sees the mistakes that nobody else but him would ever see. Like when you look at somebody else's abstract drawing, it just looks really cool. Like, I would never look at one of his drawings and think, oh yeah, that was a mistake. He didn't mean to do that. Oh, he fixed this, but it could have gone wrong. Like, when I see his drawings, they just look like amazing because they come from his inner space. 
And I think similarly to me, the last video I made where I shared some high school stories while drawing, I started the piece with the inspiration of mermaid and kind of intended for it to look a bit like a jellyfish and then decided to scrap that idea but just keep drawing and it got really busy and filled with details but it looked a little more cartoonish than my usual style and I think that's because I started it with a concept instead of just the pure expression of what's in my inner space. I started with the conceptual idea of under the sea and I had looked at a lot of pictures of mermaids over the, the few days leading up to it. And so I could see that influence translated into the drawing. And for me, I wasn't really happy with that. I looked at it and thought it's not as nice as the stuff that I usually do. Um, however, I've had some really positive feedback from that drawing. And a very lovely viewer showed me a piece that she made inspired by that one. And she also made kind of an abstract jellyfish. And that's when I realized it's just like with Peter when he makes a piece and says he's not always happy with it at the end of the video. And I found that shocking. I think similarly, all of us who create art will have certain pieces that we think are not that successful. And other people will see them and it'll be their favorite piece or they'll love it for some reason. And so if you're just getting into this kind of drawing, this meditative drawing, this non-representational, abstract, free association, thoughtless creation, if you're starting out with it and you look at a piece that you've made and think, you know what, that's not as good as I wanted it to be. Or maybe you try to draw a straight line and it gets wonky, or you try to draw a perfect circle and it looks oblong, or just something happens like you smear the ink a bit and then you have to color in a piece you meant to leave crisp. Whatever it might be, the mistakes that you perceive in that kind of abstract art are not actually mistakes if you're approaching it from the context of just pure unbridled creativity. And like I said, it, it's, it's such a personal thing, but it's something we have to push past is those initial little bumps where we start to do something and then we think, no, maybe it's not that good. Instead of scrapping it and giving up, if you just keep doing what you're doing anyway, start another drawing or draw around what you think is a mistake and see what happens. That's how your personal artistic style will start to form. And sooner or later, you'll forget about whether or not there are mistakes in the piece. You'll just keep creating. And that's when you'll really get into that beautiful meditative zone and that rhythm where it really feels as if existence is expressing its bliss through you onto that paper. What's really funny is that the way I feel when I draw and paint, it's, it's such a funny thing because you hear people say this all the time in the spiritual community, but it doesn't really click until you experience it yourself, but it's like the, the state that I enter while making art is what I was seeking all along. And so through all the external meditations I learned when I was in India and all the different teachers I've listened to, nothing that I've taken from any of that experience comes close to replicating the joy that I have and that feeling of spiritual almost like I'm channeling something higher. The, the greatest experience I've had of that in my life has been art. Um, art and when I sit down to play the piano, which I've never learned to play, but will just play. Like I said, jazz music, um, spontaneous dance, spontaneous art. I think any spontaneous creative action that we do will be the closest that we get in this physical life to touching divine consciousness because it's unfiltered and it happens without the self-censorship that we impose on ourselves in any other capacity. And what I mean by that is like, 
if you're drawing a picture that's representational, you're drawing a cartoon, or you're drawing an illustration for a magazine, or you're painting something to exhibit in a gallery, part of your mind will be contemplating how the viewer is going to perceive that work. You know, part of you will be, I guess, structuring it or building it for the viewer. But when you're doing something just for yourself in your personal sketchbook or in your personal doodle or your personal drawing, whatever you want to call it, when the goal at the inception of the creation is not to share it with others, but to make it for your own enjoyment's sake and for the spiritual experience, whether you're spiritual or not, there's something spiritual that happens when you create something just for the joy of creation. In those moments, you're not thinking, will a gallery want to show this? Will a patron want to buy this? Will a viewer understand this? Will the critics appreciate this? There's no thought of any of that at all. And if you can move yourself even beyond your own self-criticism of, do I like this, or I like this, or I don't like this, if you can just keep creating that zone that you enter and that flow that you get into beyond verbalized language, it is just so beautiful. I've referred to myself as agnostic recently, but I, I kind of need to clarify that a little because I have had visions of the beautiful goddess Mahakali. I have seen her in my inner space years before I knew even what Hinduism was. You know, I, I've had beautiful visionary dreams relating to many different Hindu deities, and that's what got me into them in the first place. I still feel a strong connection to Mahavatar Babaji, who I've mentioned in previous videos, some that were deleted from my channel because they lead people to that cult leader who I left. But it's it's been a journey for me to rediscover my own spirituality and my own beliefs and it's like i i feel like i've gone full into brainwashed delusional guru worship and then all the way down into discarding everything after finding out that that guru was a fraud and now it's like i've, I've gone up i've gone down and now i'm kind of coming back to my center again and I've seen comments on recent videos from people saying that it's too bad I had that cult abuse situation happen because now I will resent spirituality forever and may never get back into it. I can understand where their concern was coming from, but I, I just want to give you a little update that I still meditate and I still have some beautiful gods and goddesses, some deities up in my apartment. It's just not something I've been sharing on my YouTube channel because at this point in my journey, I don't know whether or not there's any benefit to sharing this stuff. It's kind of like when, when you know what you're doing, you can teach others how to do it. Like if, if you know how to cook, you can do a cooking vlog and teach other people your recipes. But if you just found out that everything you've cooked for the last decade has been tainted with poison, you're probably not going to want to jump into teaching other people how to cook again right away. So I still practice a lot of spirituality. I still listen to some Vedic mantras every day. Um, I still work with crystals, as a lot of you know, because I've got my, my gem shop, The Art of Gems, on Etsy. It's just not something that... I share on my channel as frequently. I mention it here and there. But the reason is it's it's something I'm rediscovering. It's something that's new and fresh to me again. And I'll never say never. Maybe one day I'll start sharing with you guys what meditations I am doing and which crystals I'm wearing and which deities I still feel connected with and how that all goes. But for now, I'm kind of just enjoying taking my time and taking my space to re-immerse myself in that and to kind of decide how much of it, how much of what I used to do was new age mumbo jumbo that wasn't really useful and how much of it was something 
natural and pure and genuinely spiritual because I'm not an all or nothing kind of person. It's not that either all of it is real or none of it is real. It's that I, I kind of want to separate the good from the bad, the, the truth from the bullshit and the, the genuine experiences from maybe some delusional ones. And it's not something that you can do overnight. It's something that needs to be kind of pondered over and meditated on and contemplated. But in the meantime, I can share my art because that is something that has always felt right to me. It's never led me into a negative experience or a dangerous place. And I'm really looking forward to getting into this. So that was the longest introduction I could have possibly given to this little collection, big collection of paintings. If you are drawing along with me or painting while my video is going on in the background, I'm planning to do a video any day now where I share some of the viewer art and comment on it and give some feedback and maybe some interpretation if I see something in it the way you guys like to tell me when you see something in one of my drawings. And hopefully we can get a cool artistic discussion going. So if you've made something that you'd like to share, if my videos have inspired you at all to create some art and you'd like to be featured in that video, feel free to just post your art on Instagram and tag me in it or post it on Facebook. And well, I don't see as many Facebook notifications because I've got like a bottomless black hole of notifications. Um, Instagram and Twitter are the easiest ways to get in touch with me because my Facebook feed is usually flooded uh, with just too much stuff. So anyhow, share your art and I'll let you know if I'm going to use it in that video. Anyhow, let's get into this. Thank you for watching. Bye. All right, so I'm not going to do this in any chronological order. And I'm actually going to start with something else. So here is the drawing I mentioned earlier in my intro that started out kind of influenced or inspired by the look of jellyfish for the sake of mermaid. And then I just didn't like the way it turned out. I, I looked at it, even as I was doing it, I almost scrapped the video and started over because of how much I didn't like the aesthetic of this drawing as compared to the kind of drawings I do off camera, like this one here that I really actually quite love. Uh, this one comparatively just looks too cartoonish and silly. Like there, there are too many elements to it that just aren't a reflection of my inner space. And I think it's because, like I said, I've been looking at a lot of mermaid illustrations, a lot of cartoony stuff, and no matter how much we like to believe that we are the sole origination of all of our creative output, each and every one of us is influenced and inspired by what we see and what we think about and what we read. And we're like sponges constantly absorbing whatever we pay attention to. And yeah, so like I said, I. I a few times I almost stopped drawing in the middle of this because I didn't like that little, oops, bring it down where you can see it, that little circle wasn't perfect because the line gets smudged and this looks silly and after I drew it I thought it looked like a ridiculous cartoony um, traffic light with weird spikes coming out of it. And then I remembered a quote from Peter Draws and I've pulled it up so I can read it to you with this as the glaring example of what it applies to. In one of his videos, Peter said, look, if you sit down and make something like this, and you're like, oh, why does it look this way? I don't like it. Whatever you make, I'm convinced, is better than making nothing at all, infinitely better. If the alternative is sitting around watching Netflix or playing video games, and at the end you have nothing but a high score or getting to season two, but having a drawing you're unhappy with, even, is better in the long run than having no drawing at all. So I really feel that those words of wisdom that he's given to us from one artist to many others, it's, it's so valuable. 
And I'm glad I kept drawing and didn't scrap this because there are elements to this piece I like. I really like the way this kind of pear shape with a with a with an elongated flower turned out. There's good and bad in every drawing. And if you push yourself through the point of thinking that you don't like your work and just keep going, you'll come out with something really good. And it might seem like it's hit or miss, but don't feel like uh, you have to stop if at first your drawings don't look the way you want them to. This piece turned out really nice and I did this while talking in the video. And I think another part of the reason I didn't like this one as much was that I had mentioned in the introduction to this piece that in videos I sometimes just draw in the center of the page and forget to pull the piece to the edges and I don't move the paper around as much the way I would when I'm off camera. And I consciously forced myself to break those habits and to take this to the edges and, you know, to turn the paper as I drew. Whereas this one, I didn't give myself any rules. I didn't say that I have to turn the paper or fit it to the edges. And when I didn't give myself any rules, I think it turned out a lot more beautiful and harmonious and balanced. Anyhow, there's my little spiel and my little shout out to Peter Draws with a quote from his video. And yeah, the, the first painting, by the way, these are not in any chronological order because unfortunately I didn't store them in chronological order. So I'm starting with July, August, 2009, just because this piece is probably my favorite. Um, not only because of the colors and the harmony, but the things I, I saw in it when I stopped painting and looked that were unintentional, um, but just really cool. One of those things being here, there's kind of a lower element to the painting and an upper element to the painting and this kind of green form that almost looks plant-like. I mean, there's something that definitely looks like a leaf. Totally unintentional, but it, it moves up towards this point. Just as something from this that, after I painted it, I thought it looked kind of like a sitar or like a cosmic guitar. There's like an element reaching down, just as this is reaching up, and where they meet in the center, I made this little golden colored spiral. And like I said, I didn't do it on purpose, but when I stopped painting and just started gazing at the work to see if I saw anything in it, what I immediately thought of was the Sistine Chapel ceiling where, you know, the finger of man is reaching up and the finger of God is reaching down and there it's like the, the union. What's especially interesting is that the below that's reaching up just happens to be this green earthy plant-like color and what's reaching down happens to come from something that looks like a sitar or like a guitar which I mean sitar more so than guitar for me represents spirituality but I just I just love this part of the painting that's probably my favorite part and I also like the way this turned out it's been so many years, I don't remember whether I drew it first and then painted over the drawing or if I painted first and then drew over the painting, uh, but I think it really worked well. That it's not, it's not like the lines are colored in. It's like the painting exists separately and the drawing is overlaid, but they just work together. And like I said, the words that came to me while I looked at it, and I'm, I'm really deliberately saying the words that came to me, not the words I made up, because it, it wasn't deliberate, but silence speaks the depth of still waters where manifestation requires no action. To me, that just describes in a nutshell the gift of silence, the gift of nonverbal awareness. When you're just in the moment, not thinking anything, not saying anything, not deliberately communicating anything, suddenly your manifestation doesn't require any any planning or, or any, um, you don't even have to do anything. The answers will come to you. What needs to be will be. And I think if I had sat down before making a painting and picked 
something like the Sistine Chapel ceiling as a as an inspiration point if I had thought about you know how will I visually represent this reaching up to the heavens from below and the reaching down from above I don't think I would have been able to come up with this as the painting concept sometimes things like this come out that I couldn't have done if I had planned it and and as I've said before that's what I love so much about non-representational abstract painting when there's no rules things just happen I'm showing this one next because I painted this around that same time and I was really getting into this style back then of a drawing interacting with a watercolor painting where the two are connected but it's not exactly like the drawing is just colored in so it, it just shows a, a different color palette and a different approach to the same uh, basic painting concept. Here's one that I made just last year. Like I said, no chronological order. So those two were 2009 paintings. Here's a 2019 painting, 10 years later. And unfortunately, I did not keep this very well. I, I threw it into my suitcase really quickly when I moved from Toronto and as a result of that the edges got pretty bent up but i still i still quite like the way this one turned out here we have a painting that i used as the cover for my first coloring book called color your way to creative consciousness oriented that way and this piece is one that i drew deliberately as line art for a coloring book and then i painted it in with watercolor specifically for that project and some of these i don't know when they were made because i oh here i did date it 2012 no signature just a date but at least i know which year it's from kind of a, a more limited palette here's another one i've written on sarah landry 2009 Beyond the maze of time and space, a quest to enlightenment. So I, it, I mean, I was really, I think I've mentioned this in really old videos on my channel that are probably deleted by now, but in 2009, um, I really was a sincere seeker. I, I felt like enlightenment was the only thing worth seeking in life. This one is misleading. It's on watercolor paper, but this is actually acrylic paint. And I called this piece Flowering Harmonics. And here's kind of a companion piece to that, All Seen. And I titled this after finishing it because I saw what reminded me of an eye. This one I called Going Green. Not as meditative as a title, pretty, pretty obvious because of the predominantly green colored details. Illuminating Darkness, September 29th, 2009. This piece is another piece where I tried to kind of combine the, the technique of drawing with the technique of painting, but instead of a pen, I've done the tiny little details just using watercolor and a detailed brush. I really like the way this part of it turned out. No date on that, but I think it's also around 2009 era. This piece again, it it's almost looks like it could have been done in colorful markers or fine liners, but this is all watercolor paint. And I left I left the mid part almost entirely white just because I loved the way the watercolor looked like it was outlining itself the way it dried. 2012 for this piece. No date on that one. Just a simple little one. Here's another work where I did the drawing first and then painted it in. And I really like this part here where I, I do this a lot. This is kind of a thing that repeats in a lot of my drawings. I'll show you just as an example. 
Oh, hopefully it's close to the top of my stack here. One of my most recent drawings that I finished just a few days ago has that in it. So it's, it's funny to see this, but it, it's just something that I've drawn a lot of. See how it goes on either side there? Very similarly, a work I did just a few days ago in 2020, same look. And this one is from 2012. So like I said, the, the more you do, the more you'll start to find your own style and you'll start seeing things like that in your drawings that may not be there in other people's drawings, but you repeat them a lot. This piece, I know for a fact, I, I did this as a video um, because this drawing was one of the, this actually exists in my coloring book, Color Your Way to Creative Consciousness, this line art. And I made this video painting it in after I finished the line art. Oh, and on the back, there's another drawing that was intended to go into one of my coloring books, but I think I mentioned earlier in this video, when you make a drawing for something specific, like to show in a gallery or to illustrate a concept for a magazine or to show people, sometimes your creative flow just doesn't come out as clearly. Uh, I found that the mistake I made, if you could call it a mistake, I, I call it a mistake. The mistake I made with my first two coloring books is that a lot of the pages, I had drawn them deliberately to become coloring book pages. And as a result, a lot of the, the nuances that are there in my regular art just weren't there. I'll show you what I mean. This piece drawn as an illustration to be colored in. All the lines are the same thickness. There's a generally balanced amount of space. It, it's made with very clear boundaries of the elements that need to be colored specific colors. As compared to this piece here, just drawn for my own enjoyment, for my own meditative purposes, uh, it's maybe not as obvious what needs to be colored in if this were to be used in a coloring book, which it will be. But I think that it's actually more visually interesting. The pieces that are done, not necessarily to be colored, but just to be art in their own right. So anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I still have this video up on my channel. And if I do, I'll put a link to it in the description because I, I filmed the entire process of painting it in and then sped it up. I, I really do like the way it turned out too. My favorite part is this part right here, that really lightly painted, I really watery blue, and then the big blotches of intense, vivid blue into it. That's the kind of thing you can only really do in watercolor, I think. Here's another one. This was made as the cover illustration for my second coloring book, Awaken Your Creative Consciousness. And I actually like that second book more than the first because it's not just coloring pages. I also do some step-by-step -step kind of tutorial stuff on how to make paintings. My God, here's a very old one. I painted this when I was still in, in high school. So this might even be my very first ever watercolor painting. Um, this was the painting that Mrs. Newkirk, my grade 12 art teacher saw and told me that I have to go to the library and look up Kandinsky because it reminded her of Kandinsky's work. And so it's, you know, it's thanks to this painting that I discovered, thanks to my art teacher, Mrs. Newkirk, seeing this painting that I discovered Kandinsky and found out that I wasn't the only one who makes abstract art and feels that it's a spiritual process. And this is all one piece of paper. Um, but I, I folded it over, painted this. Obviously this edge is not taped off because I, I just taped these three. Folded it over. I think I did the drawing first. And this was before I discovered my favorite pen of all time, which is Uniball pens. There we go. Reaching to show you one. This is my favorite pen for drawings because it's, I hope the camera focuses there, waterproof and fade proof. 
And so something like this, which happens if you make a drawing and then watercolor paint next to it, the ink will spread. Now what's funny is I was so upset when this happened because um, it ruined my drawing. But now that I'm looking at it, I wish I knew what pen this actually was uh, because this could be played with deliberately as a technique. Look at how that black ink turned like blue and purple where the water smeared it. I actually quite like that. Um, I'd have fun experimenting with it now. But yeah, this piece, 2002, so I was still a grade 12 kid. And really, I guess on the cusp of developing my, my personal creative style. I think this one was also 2012. It's not dated, but I'm, I'm sure I made this in 2012. And it's it's one of my favorites, to be honest. It, it's very muted, like if you compare it to my 2002 piece. Very muted tone, but I, I absolutely love the way this looks. This really feathery, blurry piece. This one I didn't like quite as much. It would have been around the same era as the first pieces I showed you where I do some drawing and then some painting together. I actually really like this part. This part, I, I did it deliberately because I was reading a book at the time called The Voice of Babaji. And it's a, I think it was VT Nilakantan who wrote it. He had some very mystical experiences while meditating in which Mahavatar Baba would kind of telepathically communicate with him and tell him spiritual concepts and um, gave him darshan, like it appeared to him and guided him on how to, how to write about Hinduism and meditation and spirituality. And within that, um, Babaji had revealed that his personal yantra or his symbol is a square inside a triangle inside a circle um, and correct me if I'm wrong it, it might have been a circle and a square and a triangle but it I know it was a symbol that combined the square the triangle and the circle and so as I made this painting I came to the part where I made this green circle and after doing the red around it I remember having this sudden feeling of put something in the work that shows my gratitude to Baba G because that book is so beautiful. It, it gives such powerful, um, whether you believe in it or not, it gives such powerful clarity on the beauty and the joy of entering a devotional space with existence. So yeah, that was my little piece for Baba G. So I love that part of it. The rest of the painting, I think it was a little too incongruous with the drawing. I don't really like this part of the drawing. Maybe that's why. Oh yeah, and I, I did something on the back of it too. This part I drew in India. And I know that for sure because it's in this purplish color of pen and it's very, very dirty as much of the stuff from India is. I don't know why guys, why is India so dirty? Why, why is there so much dust and dirt everywhere? Obvious fact, because they don't have lawns and grasses, it's a different climate, the ground is more bare. Anyhow, you can tell I had been working on that general theme of circle, square, and triangle around that time. So I wrote here, let's meet at the halfway point, which varies, of course, depending on perspective. And I've added another F to of course or off course that varies off course depending on perspective or that varies of course depending. So it's my little verbal joke to myself. And here again, it's, it's got that reaching up from below and reaching down from above that I didn't realize until after I finished it. And because I was so inspired by Mahavatar Babaji at the time, I was feeling like it's the, it's the guru who appears to us at that junction point where we're down here reaching up there, who shows us that the contact has already been made and that really 
what we're reaching out for is just a reflection of ourselves in the cosmos. That's what I was feeling as I painted this one. I really like that little guy. Sorry, I keep hitting the camera. This one from 2011. I called it Yoni Births Lingam, based on the, the Hindu depiction of goddess as the Yoni form and god as the Lingam form. Um, that title kind of came to me when I looked at the piece. I didn't deliberately try to paint a Lingam or a Yoni for that matter. I started this painting with this part here, just playing with my favorite colors. And that evolved into this kind of golden shape that afterwards reminded me of a Yoni form. And then this part that came out, it just looks like it came out of that when I looked at it afterwards. I quite like this one. As, as bare as it is, as much white space as there is, I still really like it. And my favorite part is if you hold it sideways and look at it like this, as if there's these little mountainous growths holding up a, a full moon or a sun. And this, this little thing can look a little figurative too from some angles. This piece was one of my favorites at the time. Again, from that era where I was doing drawing and painting together as the as a piece. I wish I had written the date or a little title, but I didn't. Super bright one. No date, no title. Another one of my favorites. There's something about this piece that I just really enjoy. I like the all over busy patterns and I like that it's kind of earth tone even though there are some bright colors. Like there's this bright, bright, bright orange but there's also this kind of muddied earth from space kind of globe looking formation. This piece that really reminds me of an eye. Like an eye. But I, I wrote on this one the words that came to me, what is born of love and light can be in a conflicted world, but not of it. Another one of my favorites. Simple, but I, I find it really visually pleasing and effective. Oh, here we go. Convergence, January 23rd, 2011. Sarah Stephanie, the, the name that I was given at birth, my legal name, my real name, Sarah Stephanie. Well, Samadhi Shakti, that's a name that came to me in Sanskrit one day when I was meditating and asking for a spiritual name. I just heard it in my spiritual inner space. Sudevi was the spiritual name the, the cult leader guru I was following gave me. And then beneath my name, I wrote Saraswati because I was praying to her and invoking her while I painted this one. In Hinduism, she's the goddess of arts and literature and wisdom and music and creativity. But yeah, this, this piece here would have taken me probably, you know, five or six hours. It's very detailed. I'm not sure if you can tell how detailed it is, but I would wait for one layer to dry before adding the little dots. And it has so many little tiny dots and things um, interacting with it, moving kind of from the dry parts into the wet parts. And there's just so much going on. This probably took, like I said, maybe five or six hours. Whereas this piece here would have taken about half an hour because it's just big washes of color um, kind of messy. I wasn't very precious about it when I made this one, but in some ways I find this one even more visually beautiful to look at than the ones that take more time. And it just goes to show you don't need to spend a lot of time to make something that you like. Here's another one that would have taken a bit longer. Creator, creation, creating, Sudevi and Samadhi. So that shows where my mindset was at that point. 
In Sanskrit, the word samadhi refers to being in pure bliss beyond words, being in that thoughtless, pure consciousness zone. So in a way, it's true that when I make art, I feel myself in samadhi. I really like this one. I like the color scheme, that purple and green. It's funny, now that I look at it, when I held it from this angle, again, I'm seeing a repeat of that visual thing, that reaching up and reaching down. And I, I forget who, but a viewer commented on one of my recent videos too, saying that the, the piece I had made might have been on an Instagram post where I showed a, a painting. He referred to that exact painting in on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. I think it's called Creation of Man, or I'd have to look it up. I, I don't remember right now, but that's definitely a running trend, something depicted a lot. And on this one I wrote, the mind is not where mind has never been. When we meet again, beloved in one, these offerings too shall be seen. And I don't presume now to interpret what I meant by that. It's just what came to me. This piece here. On this one I wrote, Bashar's rubber band theory perfectly accounts for the mad rush into earthly embodiment. July 31st, 2011. So for those who aren't familiar with Bashar, he, his, it's a guy named Daryl Anka who channels his higher self uh, and calls it like a, describes it being from an extraterrestrial distant future, but it's like him in a future embodiment. Whether you believe it or not, a lot of what he says is just brilliant. And Bashar's rubber band theory is that when you go through crappy experiences in life, um, the further back you go or the, the worse it is, it's like pulling a rubber band further and further back. And the further back you pull a rubber band, the farther it's going to fly forward when you let it go. So his rubber band theory is that like if you're hitting rock bottom, if it feels like your life is just not what you wanted it to be, don't worry because it's that much further that you're going to fly forward when the tension finally breaks, when that rubber band gets let go. Greetings from the indigo, violet, and gold ray, August 2011. I really like this piece. I think I posted this, maybe not. I, I wanted to post this on Instagram. I don't think I have yet. But I really like the way the, the really sharp details kind of meet up and blur with the background details. And I, I really love combining complementary colors together in a piece. Um, on the color wheel, the colors that are opposites are considered complementary colors. So purple and yellow are opposites and they really make each other look more sharp in that respect. And blue and orange are opposites. So this piece has like an orangey yellow with a bluey purple and some blue. And I just love that, the contrast it creates. Speaking of color theory, here's a piece that does not follow it. <laughs> this was another one of my coloring book illustrations that I painted in just as a demonstration of how the drawings can be colored. And yet another one. This was also one of my, I think this was from my first coloring book again. Here's the little pair that I Instagrammed recently. I made them together at the same time um, using the exact same color palette and my goal was to see how it would turn out in a finished piece if I used the exact same colors in two works but made one of them really quickly and the other one like really took my time and did it detailed. So this is the one that I did really quickly, that's the one I took my time and made it really detailed. They're both effective, but I, to be honest, I like the one I did quickly even more than the really detailed one. Another colored in piece. 
another piece that was in my coloring book. I just used some bright colors. No date on that one, nothing written. It's, it's bright, but I like it. This one I called complimentary. Orange and blue, little green. Like I said, color theory in practice. This one, the drawing part would have been from India because I see it's in that scratchy ballpoint pen. And what I wrote on it, chaos, equals approximately rhythm beyond comprehension. I kind of like that. Rhythm beyond comprehension is chaos. Good words to have come to you. Oh, and that's a, an old one. 2010. I signed it with the name that the guy in India gave me. And this one I wrote on it, with infinite thanks to the artists of crop circles, Sarah Landry, 2009. So a very old one. And back then, I would sometimes see pictures. I subscribed to a newsletter called Temporary Temples. That's a beautiful newsletter. Uh, it sends you aerial pictures of the crop circles that appear in the fields of Great Britain. And I started to notice that things I had drawn would start appearing in this newsletter as recent crop circles. And so, you know, my magical mind um, with my connection to the Arcturians and my, my feeling connection to the Arcturians anyway, I used to think maybe I was tuned into that same frequency and that what was coming up in crop circles was also appearing in my drawings. And I know I've spoken about that in, in videos back then, um, some of my earliest videos. The Blissful Expression of Samadhi Shakti is what I wrote on this one. So that would bring us to, you know, 2009 before I went to India, but after I found the cult leader who I started following because I was still using that name. This piece here, same color palette. It's funny, I can also kind of tell when pieces were made based on the, the color palettes because this was a, a color palette that had this really bright, almost highlighter neon pink in it. And the first time I did a color swatch, I didn't like it at all. Um, but then I started using it a lot because it really emphasizes the other colors well and kind of pops out the little details done in it. And on this one I wrote, when looking melts into seeing, listening into hearing, touch dissolves into feeling, in, this, in the space where taste and smell are one in satisfaction, the goal set is the goal reached. Bliss is no longer a state of being, but the being itself. Yeah. On oh, that one is signed, Manati Sudevi, April 2010. So it's kind of funny though. The pieces I like the best were before I went there to India. Although not always, because I, I quite like this one too. My favorite part of this one is this space right here. If that could be cropped, like just this piece. This one I wrote, a year gone by and all that could change has changed and back again. The dream, the dream, the dream. Oh, and that's interesting. On the back I did kind of a scribble, a paint scribble. I'm gonna start having to flip through these a little quicker. It's been 40 minutes already, I'm sorry. So I'm not gonna read every single one and talk about every single one. I'll do kind of a quicker flip through from here out. This one I called Transcendental Smoke 2009. Transcendental Smoke, I was probably thinking back to a DMT experience. Superimposed 2009. 
Dimensional Frequencies 2009. I actually made prints of this at the time and sold them uh, in a gallery on Main Street in Vancouver and it was quite a good seller. This one I titled Arcturian Unification 2009. And I, I really love this painting. I, I made prints of this and sold this one too back then. Um, and what I really liked was this right here. The, the really high pigmented, medium pigmented, watered down, but all the same color and the way it appeared. I liked it. This one I called Groundless. I sold prints of this one too. I actually have a print of this hanging in my kitchen right now. A framed print. Really like almost everything about this one. The reason I didn't have this one made into a print was that I didn't like this part. I felt like I shouldn't have put the pink over the blue. I should have kept the two as they had been. quite like this one. Again, it's got that blurry yellow part. The interconnectedness of sacred geometry, biomechanics, harmonic chaos, and the science of enlightenment is what I wrote on that piece. Okay, some of it might be a little too... I'm not sure how I feel about it. This one I titled An Octave Higher, and I'm not sure why. What's funny is this piece I was never really a big fan of, but when I took my portfolio of paintings into the print shop, a, a really cool paint shop in Vancouver called Third Eye Productions, um, when I was showing the guy there the different paintings I wanted to make into prints, he really encouraged me to make this one into prints too. He said people would buy that. And I I wasn't so into it because I was experimenting with like a calligraphy nibbed uh, marker pen, two marker pens. And I, I just thought that it looked too experimental and silly, but he, he said he really loved this part here where, where this one line goes onto this pyramid-like thing and then the red pen kind of comes out from that really precisely at that point. And what's funny is I, I think there might be a difference between masculine taste in abstract art and feminine taste in abstract art because I sold a lot of paintings of, a lot of prints of this painting to guys. Uh, this one I wrote as above, so below. And it was motivated by the title for this one wasn't so much words that came to me, it was more my what I was seeing when I looked at it, which is that this part drawn in those calligraphy type pens below really mimics the look of what's above it. I really like this part of this one. This one was just a little quickie, didn't write anything on it. This one is unfinished. I started to paint in one of my drawings and I just really liked the way it looked having half of the piece painted over and half of the piece left bare. And from time to time over the years, when I go through my art, when I look at it, I think, you know, I should repeat this peacock feather sort of peacock tail look and do it here where I've drawn this obviously feather like bit. But I, I haven't done it because I just, like I said, I, I like that contrast between the painted part and the bare part. This piece was like a paint scribble. It's not watercolor paper, it's it's a cardstock. Everything else I've shown has been real watercolor paper. And so when when you paint something like this on watercolor paper, um, let's see if I can find something similar. Uh, I really want to describe this properly. Okay, when you paint something like this, on, on real watercolor paper, 
it blends out and soaks into the paper and settles into the paper in a way that um, it doesn't look like it's been done with a marker on binder paper like that. So I, I was playing with the watercolor medium on a paper not made for watercolor and so it just turned out looking super messy and gross. But I really, really like this. This one part that reminds me of like a, a sunset through some kind of architectural structure. So the only reason I didn't throw that little painting in the garbage is because of that one little design element. A little bit of painting on a big giant paper. I called it Simplicity, dated it 2010. Sorry, the camera pane doesn't really include that whole one. I really like this one. This one was my, one of my favorites. Ah, here's what I was trying to explain. So when, when stuff like this is painted on proper watercolor paper, it blends out and smears like this. That's what I was going for. And I, I think this might be why a lot of new artists or people who are freshly exploring art techniques might get really frustrated uh, because they'll see something like this and try to try to make a version of it or their copy of it. But if it's being done on the wrong kind of paper, it's going to look scratchy and not as nice. Um, and, and that's why I think it's such a disservice people do to kids. There's another sun in, in an architectural sort of thing. Huh. I'm just noticing that now. That's like a trend around that time. But it's, it's such a disservice that people do to kids where they give them cheap crayons and um, what's that craft paper they give kids called? Construction paper that tears the moment you put a pencil to it. So of course kids get really frustrated with their art. And then of course, as people grow older, mature, they stop making art because it's frustrating and it feels like they can't do what they want to do. A lot of that can, can be related to the quality of the materials being used. If, if you're using the wrong kind of paper, for example, um, it can affect the whole thing. Here's another example of using the same exact color palette, but one really quickly done piece and one piece that takes a lot more time and uses more details. There's really something to it. I, I like it. Could, maybe it's just the size that the pieces I do more quickly tend to be bigger, but there's something about this one that I quite like too. Another really quicky one. The splatters on this first happened by accident because I, I was cleaning one of my brushes in a jar of water and it splattered across the page. And it was a happy accident. I kind of liked it so I did more splatters deliberately. That is the one and only time in my entire life when I have ever deliberately done any kind of splatter painting. Anyway, I like this one. I like the color palette a lot. I love the way the blue blends into that brown. Actually, this piece is from, I think, 2012. Too bad I didn't date it. It was the, the color theme of that piece that I remembered years later that inspired me to make this one last year. It's that color theme. And I, I might use more of that color combination, these tan browns and kind of true blues. I like it. Oh, there's one I haven't painted yet. Another um, piece that I made for a coloring book and then planned to fill in with color. Probably get to it. Don't like this one at all. <laughs> Ooh, but I love the drawing on the back of this one. 2017. Sorry, one of my hairs is on it. Yeah, I really like this drawing. I love these little 
like jelly roll things. I don't know what those would be. But there's something about that drawing I quite like. And we come to the bottom of this pile. This is also not proper watercolor paper. It's a really thin, like sketchbook paper. And again, it, it shows that when you do something on the wrong kind of paper, it can look not as nice. This is very recent too. I made this in a video and I like that part, but the general color palette, not so nice. This turned out looking too much like a heart. If you wonder what all that shaking is, my cat has climbed into my lap and I think with that, oops, yes, yeah, she's leaning against the tripod. So I'm going to say bye for now. Thank you for watching. And yeah, tag me in your art if this has inspired you to create anything. If, be, if you've been drawing along with me or painting along with me, I'd love to see what you've made. Thanks for watching. Bye. Okay, so after filming, right after filming, I remembered that there are more recent paintings that I forgot to show. So we've got this one very quickly done. I think this baby took me 25 minutes. I called it Experimental Mess. May 3rd, 2020, so earlier this month. Then we've got this little guy from, I think, 2012. This is the one I put on Instagram recently. And somebody mentioned that this part looks like a, a Buddha or a meditating figure sitting under an arch. And I, I quite like that part. Here's the one I did in my most recent video where I painted it and kind of sped it up and then shared some experiences. Here is another very, very, very old one. I painted this either, either in early 2002 or in late 2001. So either grade, end of grade 11 or beginning of grade 12. Um, back then I didn't have a watercolor palette like I use now. Uh, like nowadays, there's my cat saying hello. <laughs> She's gonna just walk across my painting. Nowadays, I, I use one of these kinds of palettes with a bunch of different colors, so, like this. But back then, I bought five tubes of watercolor paint, red, yellow, blue, black, and white. So I mixed all my own colors. And I kind of like the way it turned out. Like all the green is, the green mixed with a little white. I've, I've mixed a lot of black in with a lot of it to give it like some shading and texture. I really like the way this part turned out. And I, I think I might invest in some real, you know, proper pigmented watercolor and tubes again because it just behaves differently on paper than the, the kind of cheaper pan palette ones. Oh, there we go. Yeah, 2001. Pardon my messy handwriting. That is a one. I know for a fact because I used to buy these. Yuck. Don't mind the big blob of cat hair stuck to it. Um, I used to buy these huge sheets of watercolor paper back then when I was in high school because it was cheaper than buying a stack of watercolor paper. I would buy a huge sheet and then just rip it down to the sizes I wanted to work with. Um, and for that reason, a lot of my oldest watercolor paintings, like here's a more recent drawing, not painted yet, but I obviously intended to paint that in at some point, but all, all my recent stuff, meaning from like 2005 and onwards when I went to art school are on these perfectly shaped and sized pieces of paper, but the stuff I did in high school, um, I've got a vacuum. I've got cat hair in clumps on everything. They all have these really uneven tears. I didn't even tear it properly or use a cutter. But anyway, yeah, so there's, now it feels like the video is complete. I've got all the watercolor paintings I have, at least all the ones I have here that haven't sold to people uh, or been given away. So again, thank you for tuning in. Bye once again. See you in the next video. Much love and happy creating.